Thanks, Rez, for that uh, introduction. And um, it is a real privilege to be able to share with you from, uh, from Genesis. I do have a couple of announcements. First of all, we, the elders did have a retreat this last week, Thursday and Friday. And we ask you to pray, and, uh, and God did speak to us, and we, we very much appreciate your prayers. Um, we'll be sharing some of what we learned and heard over the next few weeks. As we prepared for the retreat, um, Dave Carson felt that this was a time for him to step down as an elder and as the elder council chair. So uh, after prayer and discussion, the elders did accept Dave's decision. Um, we're grateful for his service to Marymount and his continued wisdom in our congregation. Um, Dennis was appointed the, um, by the elders to be chair of the elders and uh, in Dave's place and will also be responsible for the prayer ministry. So, With that, let's pray again. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we get to learn more about creation and especially about Adam and Eve. We pray you would speak to us through your spirit and through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I've entitled this, Adam and Eve Together at Last. And this is a fun part of the story. It's part of the creation story. And sometimes we miss what happens between Genesis 1 and Genesis 3. We focus on the creation of Genesis 1 and then the fall. But um, some of that creation unfolds here um, in Genesis chapter 2 with Adam and Eve. There are a couple of sub-themes during that. Um, the first one that I'm going to address right away is, how do we reconcile Genesis 1 with Genesis 2? It looks at first glance like there might be some, some differences, so how do we reconcile that? And then another thing that I'll be asking throughout, and I think we should ask throughout actually the, all of the steps, um, all of the stories, is God good? So keep that in mind as we go through this. As we look at Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 2, there are some differences. Um, the first one is the name of God. In Genesis 1, the name of God is Elohim. And that's a word that means, uh, or that's a, a description of God as awesome and majestic creator, also as judge. But in Genesis 2, the name changes to Yahweh. Yahweh is God's personal name, and it's used in the context of God having a relationship with his people. So we think of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And you see, um, Lord is, um, is capitalized in, in lowercase on that table, Trish. Um, Lord is capitalized. So that's the, um, when you see Lord God, that's Yahweh. We also see some other things unfolding. Humans start as man, male and female, and they become Adam, man and woman. The waters, very general terms, and then specific rivers are named. Uh, the geography associated with those rivers goes from land and ground to some very specific places. Creatures get names. Adam names all the creatures. And this one, this last one isn't there, but I'm an engineer, so this is kind of how I think. Um, one way to look at this is Genesis 1 is the architecture, or you could say the master plan, the conceptual design, and the detailed design and fabrication or manufacture is Genesis 2. So I think that'll play out as we see, um, as we see Genesis 1 with male and female, and then in Genesis 2, Eve actually coming after Eve. So some of the questions that um, I have last week, Dennis had seven questions, I've just got three questions. And these are questions that I think we can ask of any scripture. So. What does this passage say about God? What does this passage say about us? And what are we going to do about it? Are, are we to think differently? Are we to act differently? What is God saying to us? So um, hopefully we ask that every time we come to Scripture. So Genesis uh, 1, 26 to 28. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to read this. It's going to be up on the screen. And this is the framework. This is the... Um, the architecture. So if we can read this together, please. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, 
and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over every the and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Thank you. Have a seat. So we see some things in these verses um, that I'd like to point out. First of all, humans are unique. Now, some of this you have to read the earlier parts of Genesis 1. But mankind or humans are the only creatures that God made that are made in God's image. We also see humans are to rule over the animals. So if, you, if someone says to you on a news program or a friend or whatever, well, humans are just another animal, that's not what God says. We are not just another animal. We're not equal to whales. God created us in his image, and God created us to rule over them. So we, we are different. We can, we can look at this to instruct us. Um, the other part, and I think this is really obvious, but I feel compelled to say it, Male and female was part of the architecture. So from the very beginning, God created male and female. We'll see Eve comes along a little later, but in the architecture, female is part of that. So the next section is Genesis 2, 4 to 7. Dennis last week actually went through uh, Genesis 2, 3. So I'm going to pick up at Genesis, Genesis 2, 4 to 7. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being." The first thing I'd like to point out, that first little verse up there, this is the account of the heavens and the earth. Um, last week, Dennis talked about some of the numbers, the number three, the number seven, the number ten. Well, this is the first of ten accounts. So there are other accounts of Noah, uh, Adam, Isaac, Jacob, etc. This one is unique. It's the account of, of creation. Um, and those, those others, there's the narrative or the story of Noah, and then there's the account of Noah. And so there's a, that narrative, and then the account are all the details. So that's similar to this. These are some of the details of creation. Um, God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. So at a funeral often, um, you know, we came from dust, we returned to dust, and that, that's scriptural. But actually, if you think about Eve's creation, it's a whole lot more interesting. We'll get to that in a minute. But it's um, God created Adam from the dust of the ground. And the other thing that's unique about humans, God breathed life into Adam. It's almost as if he was not a living being at the very end. He was not a living being until God breathed into his nostrils. Genesis 2, 8 to 10. Uh, one, of, one of the things we decided at the retreat, it was very appropriate to do a lot of time just reading God's words. So I'm, I'm reading through all of chapter, almost all of chapter 2. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and from there it was separated into four headwaters." So as I, as I came to this, I asked myself, how big was Eden? We've got a little garden in the backyard. Um, my wife has out there. There's some vegetables, some, um, some spice, some herbs, and, um, and things. That's a small garden. So I, I was wondering how big this garden was. Then I saw all these trees, and I thought, well, it's big enough to have a number of trees. And then I saw that it had a river that becomes four rivers. So this must have been a very large garden. We don't know the specifics. We don't know if there were um, 10 trees, 100 trees, 1,000 trees, but um, let's say there were 100 trees, big trees. This was a big garden. There were some unique trees in there, two unique trees that are mentioned. Tree of life, 
and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Those are talked about in a little bit more later. So how good was the fruit? So does anybody know what this is? Pomegranate, yes, this is a pomegranate. I was in Italy um, the summer of 1982, and I went to Italy, and they had peaches, and the peaches were about as big as this pomegranate. I didn't have a grapefruit, so this is what we had. And it was delicious. In fact, the first time I had one of these big peaches, I had to go straight and take a shower. I mean, it was, it was, it was juice all over me. So as we were leaving from... Um, this intervarsity group, as we were going to northern Italy, I had one of these peaches on the bus, pardon me, on the train. So I had to eat it with a Frisbee because it was so juicy, and it was absolutely delicious. So I, I'm thinking that all of the fruit in the garden was absolutely delicious. Your favorite, just think of your favorite fruit, juicy, sweet, ripe, just perfect. And I'm thinking that's, that's what the garden was like. Next verses. I, I skip a few verses to talk about the rivers and the land, but I um, mean, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So the number of things we can, we can pick up from this. Adam was given work before the fall. So this is physical labor. He said, go take care of it. That's, that's work. And I believe that pattern, I think work is good. I, I even think that there will be work in heaven. So God gave um, Adam work before the fall. Another thing, Eve is not around. So this command is to the man. So God commanded the man. So as we get to the fall, you'll see the, uh, that, that theme come back. Did God have the right to tell Adam to not eat from that one tree? Was that God's right? That's something to, to struggle with. We can, we can say, well, that's not fair. But in fact, God created Eden on all these trees. God created Adam. God could set whatever rules he wanted. He could have said, there are 100 trees here. You may not eat from 99, but there's this one scrawny tree in the corner. He could have said that. But in fact, he said, you can have all of these. It's like a, a mother that made 100 plates of cookies and said to her kids, you can have any of these cookies you want, except this one plate is, is not for you. That's, that's a pretty good treat for those kids. Well, this was pretty good for Adam. But he told him, do not eat from this one tree. It could be that not, God did not want Adam to have this experiential knowledge of sin. God was protecting Adam. Do not eat from this tree. So another question we can ask of this, was the specific tree important, or could the test have been something else? Well, I think God could have had a park bench and said, do not sit here, and that would have sufficed. He could have had any test he wanted. I don't think there, in this case that there's anything special about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil except obedience. I want to come back to one of my questions. Is God good? So as we come to, this, to Eden, all these great trees, it's, it's beautiful there. Is God good? And I would submit his creation was very good. Another thing that comes out... Um, is that obedience is important to God. This comes out in Genesis 2 to 3. It comes out in Deuteronomy 28, where God, as, the, as Moses had, um, had, had led the Israelites through the desert, it says, here are all the blessings for obedience. And, you know, blessings, the fruit of your womb, you know, your health, um, your crops, Lots of blessings for obedience. But then in 28, 14 to 68, a lot more verses, curses for disobedience. Very important throughout Scripture, a theme is obedience. In 1 Samuel 15, Samuel is the prophet, and he tells Saul, 
God wants you to kill all the Amalekites. Put to death men, women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Very clear instruction. God said, it's time to kill those. And Saul mostly obeys. He takes care of all of the, uh, all of the people except for the king, except for Agag. And he kills almost all of the animals, except Samuel comes to him and says, what is this um, uh, lowing of cattle and this bleeding of sheep? What, what am I hearing? And Saul says, oh, I killed most of them. I kept some of the best for sacrifice to God. So he, he did not fully obey. He had a great excuse. He said, I want to I save some for sacrifice and burnt offerings. Well, if we go to... 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23, this is the response that Samuel had. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you rejected the word of the Lord... He has rejected you as king. So here's the king that mostly obeyed God, but not fully, and God took the kingdom away from him and eventually gave it to David. That's the theme of obedience. In 1 John 5, 3, it says, This is love for God to obey his commands. So we know and God knows that we love God when we obey him. Genesis 2.18. So to me, this is kind of the pivot point of this chapter. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. I think this one little verse is packed. First question, who is God speaking to? Is he speaking to Adam or maybe to the rest of the Godhead? We, we don't know for sure. I'm thinking Adam may have heard part of this. Another question, it is not good. Everything up until this point said, it is good, it is very good. And here God says, it is not good. So how, how do we reconcile that? I see it as there's an architecture, you've got this design of the car, it's only got two wheels. It's got an engine, but no transmission. It's not complete. So it is not good because it's not complete. That word helper is interesting. We can read all sorts of things into that. I think in English, we often think of it as a subordinate position. So an executive has a helper that opens his mail, that cleans his shoes, or whatever. Um, there's also the context of a peer. So I'm, I'm swamped this week, can you help me out? Or I'm taking next week off, can you cover for me? There's also help from a superior. Um, I prayed for help to God today that my words would be clear. Um, we can go into a boss and say, I, I don't know how to do this, can you help me? And the, the Hebrew has similar um, things. They use the word ezer, which Susan Carson helped us to understand. And it also has, it, it can be a subordinate, a peer, or superior relationship, but it's mostly used in the Old Testament of God as our helper. So it's often and more frequently used as someone superior, but there's no connotation here of a subordinate relationship in this term, um, Adam needs a helper. So it's interesting, what would you think would follow as you read this after this verse? So, so don't look down. So God says, I will make a helper for him. So what, what's going to follow? Adam's going to take a nap and Eve's going to be created. That's that's what we would think, but that's actually not what happens, happens next. In Genesis 2.19, this is the, a little bit of the intrigue of this story. It's a little bit of the uh, almost playfulness of God in the way that this unfolds. So it goes straight from there to, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field, all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. 
But you have to ask the question, right after identifying a need, why did God parade all these animals before Adam? And we don't know all the words that were exchanged between God and Adam. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're not all recorded. So it could be that God said, I'm going to parade these before you. Look for a helper. Or maybe sort of implied it. We, we don't really know. I think we also see God, is, God assigns work to the... Oops. That's all right. You can go ahead and play it. That's fine. Um, if you were Adam, what would you call these, these animals? Proboscis monkey. That's kind of interesting. Sloth and a peacock. Well, none of those worked. None of those fit as a, as a good helper for, for Adam. I don't, even think, I don't even think a dog, you know, could have been a best friend, but not really what Adam had in mind. Um, one other thing I was going to mention about that passage, again, Adam is assigned work to do. The first time it was physical labor, this time it's mental work. So God is, again, assigning work. But you see some tension in the air. So the angels know about the architecture. They know, oh, there's a male and a female coming. All the other animals, there's a male and a female. What's up with Adam? And Adam is sensing a little bit of this. So Genesis 2.21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. So there's an obligatory thing you always have to say when you read this passage. Eve didn't come from his feet to be under him, or from his head to be over him, but from his side to be equal to him. So there, okay, I've said that. Um, so, so God saved the best for last, in my opinion. I think the last of God's creation is right here, and I think, and probably most of us would agree, that God saved the best for last when he created Eve. It's like parents that have gifts for their kids. Um, so there are lots of gifts. The kids are excited. They tear open the packages. And then at the end, you know, after all the thanks, this is perfect, how'd you know? Then the parents say, oh, there is one more thing. Let's go in the basement, and there's a puppy which is exactly what they want. It's the best for last. Um, save the best for last. Or let's go in that, out in the garage and there's a bicycle. Or as they get older, it might be a car. So that's, that overwhelms all the other, other gifts. We're going to see a little video from a man I respect. You can see my little iPad here. Um, Steve Jobs, who died in 2011, um, was was very creative, he was an innovator, co-founder of Apple, and he used to make product announcements. He would talk about this widget's going to get faster or more storage or more resolution or whatever, and he would make all these announcements. There's always tension in the air because people knew that something else was coming, and they, they never quite knew what that would be. And if, so if you listen for that anticipation and the cheers that come as he um, does his famous one more thing line, But we do have one more thing. <laughs> so thank you. But there is one last thing I'd like to talk to you about today. Uh, but there is one more thing that I want to talk about. But there is one more thing. You guys have sat through a lot, and I really appreciate it today. And uh, there is one more thing. Well, Stephen Jobs was a great storyteller. And in this, I see the way God plays out Genesis 2. God is a great storyteller, and he's, he's built in this, this, um, this message. Genesis 2, 23 to 24. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, 
and they will become one flesh. As if Adam said, this is it. None of those other animals worked. This is it. I think we also see that God knew what Adam needed more than Adam knew. I think if Adam had a year to think through what would a perfect helper be, I don't think he'd have come up with half of what Eve was. We also see in this passage a model for companionship and family. So before it said it was not good that man's alone, God answered that need with a wife. So when I say this is a model for companionship and family, do you think that, is that a stretch or is that there? I, I don't want to add more to the story or take anything away. If, if there's something there, I don't want to, to not address it. Well, I believe that that is very much there. In fact, in the New Testament, some Pharisees came in Mark chapter 10. They came and tested Jesus and asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, Jesus replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote this law, Jesus replied. Trish, if we could go on. And then Jesus said, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. That's Genesis 1, that's the architecture. And then... For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. I don't believe it's a stretch at all to say this is God's design, this is God's architecture, this is God's plan for how families should work. I believe... A different question could have been asked of Jesus, and, and the answer would have been the same. The question could have been, there were a lot of the patriarchs that had multiple wives. Is that okay? I believe, God would have, I, I believe Jesus would have said, let's go back to the beginning. Here's the way it was created. Um, he made them male and female, and that is the family structure. Last verse of Genesis 2. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So I've taught lots of junior hires and uh, fifth and sixth graders, so you have permission to giggle now if you want to giggle. So We end Genesis chapter 2 with intimacy. Intimacy and transparency between Adam and Eve, between God and humans. There was no shame. There was nothing hidden. There was complete transparency. This is God's architecture and God's design. You have Eden, you have man and woman, you have God. To use the manufacturer analogy, this is the perfect car straight off the assembly line. This is, this is as designed, this is the way it's supposed to be. So again, we can ask the question, is God good? I believe he created a wonderful world with a wonderful design for families, with intimacy, and that's where we end chapter 2. That's better than that, because we, he actually ends the whole book in a similar place. In Revelation chapter 22, we read, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. I believe just as God created a perfect environment at the end of chapter 2, we, we see that reflected, that's what we come back to. In heaven, I believe it will be perfect I believe there'll be great fruit, uh, there'll be no more tears, no more curse, and this is all part of God's design. Our perfect relationship with God will be restored. There is one difference, though, and that is, in Genesis 2, there's a husband and a wife. 
in heaven, there's, we're not, there's not marriage, there's not given in marriage. So um, we will all have that intimate relationship with God, that perfect relationship with God. I want to come back to those questions I asked at the beginning. What does this passage say about God? What does it say about us? And what are we going to do about it? Well, if we were in a round table, we could discuss this, and I'm sure God would give us lots of insights. We're not in that forum, so I get to answer some of those questions. So I believe this says about God, he's the creator, he's the architect, he's the designer, he's the manufacturer, and he had a good design. God is good. Everything he created was good. But we also need to recognize that God demands obedience. What does this say about us? We need companionship. We're not meant to live on an island. We need companionship. The other thing is God does not make junk. So what are you going to do about it? How are you going to think? Are you going to act? What, what, do, we, what do we need to do differently? And that's, I'll leave that one up to you. As the worship team comes, I'd like to close our time in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your design. Thank you for the narrative of the creation of Eve and, and of all of your creation. Father, thank you that you did create us for intimacy. And Father, that you restore that intimacy as we live eternally in heaven with you. Pray that these words would... Um, speak to us and that you would direct us on how we should respond to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.